I'm uh, pleased to uh, thank the Eileen and Warren Martin Lectureship for Emerging Studies in Bible and Theology Endowment for providing funding for this week's interfaith lectures. I've got a whole bunch of stuff here about Jack Spong. You've heard it. And if, even if you're watching the uh, DVD, you've heard it on uh, the former three lectures. I'm going to take a point of personal privilege here, if I can get through it. It's not often that you get to thank publicly someone on whose shoulders you stand. Jack and I were talking earlier. We've both been in the public eye. We've, we've both had a very public ministry. And we were talking about how, how amazing it is to go somewhere and find out that you've affected someone's life without even knowing them. Uh, this is a man who has affected countless lives, who, have, who has uh, kept so many people who have been hurt by the church, at least somewhere near the church, and with a language that allows them to participate. But most especially, he was out in front on two issues long before it became admirable to do so. One was the ordination of women, and one was the ordination of gay and lesbian people. It is because, yeah. And it is because of that early work that he did, and all of the work that built on it, uh, that lets me wear a purple shirt today. There is um, no one who has been braver and ready to take whatever came his way for saying the truth. And so literally, I stand on his shoulders as do so, so many of us. Would you join me in thanking Bishop Jack Spong? You fixed me up. <laughs> yeah. Every time I think I'm doing well, somebody makes me cry. <laughs> Well, today is the day, the final address of this week, the final address at Chautauqua, the final address of my life. It all began on June the 12th, 1976, when I was made a bishop of the Episcopal Church. I served for 21 years as a priest, 24 years as a bishop. In the last 18 to 20 years doing lectures on my books around the world. I've been to every continent in the world except Antarctica. And I wanted to go there, but Chris wouldn't go. <laughs> and I'd rather not be anywhere that she's not present. But it's been a wonderful trip. And I, I do, I'm not sad that it's coming to an end. The host at the House of Missions told me last night about the time they had an elderly man down, down here and they had to tend to his needs all the time. I don't want to be here when somebody's mopping my brow and it's drooling out both sides of my mouth. And uh, so I'm looking forward to retiring with most of my faculties intact. Let me say that if this church that I love is to live into the future, it must recover its original meaning and identity. It must shed those aspects that are divisive, condemning, and authoritarian. It must abandon creeds that are tribal 
in favor of universal inclusiveness. You must use formulas to include, never to ban. In short, to have a future, the Christian church must become a universal community. The challenges are great. Can Christian theology once again be enabled to interact with contemporary knowledge? Can Christian creeds and liturgies be made to reflect reality rather than nostalgia? Can Christianity affirm human oneness while still embracing its traditional diversity? Can this faith create a new institutional form that fosters a truth-seeking universal community? These are the questions I've tried to raise in my books, in my lectures, and in my career. And I now bring this work to a conclusion with the hope that a resounding yes will be heard from this newly enlightened faith tradition. I don't expect it all at once, but if a few hear it, it will grow. Hence, of this kind of purpose have always been present in Christianity. We do not have to create them out of nothing. Perhaps G.K. Chesterton was correct when he said that Christianity has been tried and found warning. Has not been tried and found warning. It simply has been found difficult and hadn't been tried. I'd like to start today with Matthew, who is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. When Matthew brought his Gospel to a conclusion, somewhere about 85 of this common era, he placed words to the effect into the mouth of the risen Jesus. And these are the words. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We have tended to hear these words as an institutional charge calling the church's members to go convert the heathen. I don't think they had any meaning like that. When Matthew wrote, however, there wasn't even a Christian church. Christianity was part of Judaism. There was no institutional church seeking to grow. So these words must have meant something quite different to the first leaders. Indeed, they did. Matthew was, I believe, sounding the call to a universal humanity. Go make disciples of all nations meant to Matthew. Go beyond the boundaries of your religion. Go beyond your security system. Go beyond your fears. It meant go to those whom your religious tradition has defined as unclean, uncircumcised, unsaved, unbaptized, and unbelieving. Go to those that you renounce as infidels or heretics or agnostics or atheists. It meant go beyond the boundaries that you have erected in your biologically driven search for survival. What then are we to do? Matthew's Jesus was quite clear. If we do not know how to translate the meaning of those early words, you ought to proclaim the gospel, said Matthew. To Matthew, that did not mean that we are to provide our converts with a set of formulaic Christian answers. It meant rather that we are to make all persons aware that they are included within the infinite love of God. That's what the gospel means. Matthew's words, which we have called the Great Commission, were first attributed to Jesus. It was not a call to missionize the world. It was a call to build a world in which human oneness can flourish. It was a call to universalism. This essential aspect of the Jesus message was not struck in Matthew alone. When the Gospel of Luke was being written, Pentecost, an event in which the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples of Jesus and all the world, the author made sure that it was understood as a universal happening. Those present at Pentecost, Luke said, included the people from all over the known world, as he understood it. It's a rather remarkable list. And Paul tried to describe to the Galatians what was involved in what he called put on Christ, 
He said that it meant that human divisions must disappear. Christ must be served in every person. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer male nor female. There is no longer bond or free. That's what Jesus meant. And that's what the original Christ experience was. Before we began, became scripture's defenders and before the creeds became the essence of our faith. It was also before any form of liturgy became the only way to worship. From its very inception, Christianity has kept a sense of human oneness, but it's been buried under layers of ecclesiastical power expressions. The original vision of Christ was not captured within the church's power needs, but in such things as universal hymns, like in Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, and the more modern hymns to universalism, such as all are welcome, and for everyone there's a place at the table. The Christian invitation to the world has always been, Come unto me, all ye that travel and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It was never meant to have a limit. It was never meant for some of ye, but for all of ye. Were these words attributed to Jesus intended to be a call for us to rest from our human labor? I do not think so. The passage was a call to rest from the eternal human struggle to become by accepting what you are. It was an invitation for all to dwell in the joy of a capital B being. Christianity had never been about believing correctly. It was never meant to provide a basis on which believers would separate heresy from truth. It was always a call to practice the task of living and loving and being. In the words of the new baptism formula in my church, it was a time we are to seek Christ and all he means in every human being. When charting a new reformation, however, we must engage in the task of getting even deeper into the vision of universalism. It has to do only with erasing, not only with erasing human divisions, but with such relativizing of our most cherished beliefs. Creeds can no longer bring us together. Doctrines such as the Incarnation and the Trinity can never again pretend that we have defined either God or Jesus. Can the church set these things aside without cutting all ties to what is called historical Christianity? I think we can. And I think we must. The Christianity of the future cannot live inside the doctrines of the past. Doctrines are always a description or a definition of our God experience. They are never our God experience. My experience is my ability to perceive God. But the nature of God is beyond my ability to describe. The same thing is true of the fundamental doctrine of Christianity known as the Incarnation. That doctrine makes Jesus not unlike the comic strip character Clark Kent, who turned out to be Superman in disguise. We must move beyond the now irrelevant dualistic patterns to discover the holy at the heart of the human. A doctrine called the Incarnation will never get us that. When I contemplate the meaning of Jesus, I come back again and again to his image as the ultimate boundary breaker. Boundary breaker. In whom what it means to be human is constantly being expanded. The meaning of the incarnation to me is that the life of God is always met inside the human. Christianity is not about religion. It's about life. God is not an external being. God is being itself, manifested in all that is. So we look anew at the biblical portrait of Jesus 
And we see it in terms of being, not doing. In the New Testament, who is it that comes to Jesus? Look and see. They're Samaritans. They're Gentiles. They're lepers. They're adulterers. They're thieves. They're broken, the warp, the damage. And each finds in him the love and acceptance of God. That's what it's about. That's what Christianity has always been about. And that's what the Christianity of tomorrow must reflect if we will continue to live. The language that refers to Jesus as the Son of God, I am now convinced, has nothing to do with some literalized version of its mythology. It has everything to do with the fact that God was experienced as the source of life in the life of Jesus, as the source of love in the love of Jesus, and as the ground of being in the being of Jesus. So in Jesus, the human and the divine flow together, for they are one. They flow together in you and me, too. The dualism of the past simply fades away. The doorway into the divine is to become deeply and fully human, and everyone is invited to that. And that leads me to express my deepest convictions. I call this statement my mantra. But it's not designed to be an incipient form of a new Christian creed, which might be imposed on tomorrow's Christians. The days for believing that anyone can ever reduce the experience of the holy to a set of propositions that can be recited and believed are frankly over. I do not want to go back to the world of traditional religion. I live rather in a time and a space where there is not now or ever can be something that might be called a timeless creed, a set of beliefs that might endure forever. So my mantra is intended only to be my statement at this time of where I am today, the place at which I've arrived on what might be the last day of my journey. I want to state something positively, something about the conclusion that I presently hold and bear witness to why I continue to be a member of this Christian community and to see the Christian story as something that compels me into discipleship. I long ago walked beyond a literal interpretation of the Bible. How anybody can read that book and treat it literally is beyond me. I journeyed deeply into the biblical, biblical content I move far beyond the literal surface and I discover in its depths both meaning and insights to which I continue to feel a deep allegiance. Almost every book I've written has been a Bible book, but it's not a Bible that Jerry Falwell would recognize. I long ago moved beyond what I call creedal theology which is a product of the fourth century. wonder why that was so holy. But I've not moved beyond the hope that I can place the insights of Christianity into a coherent form, at least for my generation. I long ago moved from the worship patterns of the 13th century, which tend to portray God as a parent figure who needs to be flattered. That's why we call him Almighty God. That's flattery. We say flattering words to God all the time. We call them praise, but they're flattery. Or God is perceived as a judge before I am compelled to grovel in my knees in a penitence while I beg this God to have mercy on me. I don't ever want to see a human being do that. It might be okay to pray for mercy if you're standing before an abusive parent and you're a quivering child. That might be a place where you could say, have mercy. You might find having mercy, a prayer for mercy, to be, make sense if you are a convicted criminal hanging before, or standing before a hanging judge. You might want to ask for mercy. But for the life of me, I can't understand why a child of God would stand before God and never utter that prayer. 
I'm standing before what I call the infinite other. Human language is woefully inadequate when one seeks to speak of that which cannot be embraced inside the human. Therefore, I have to use human words since there are no others. But I have to know what I'm using and why I'm using these words. And I do use them. But I use them with the caveat that words can only point to, they can never capture or hold the truth that I'm seeking to speak. With that warning clearly stated, I bring this work to a close by sharing my mantra, my current statement of belief. I cannot tell you who God is or what God is. No one can do that. Why don't we understand that? That's not within the capacity of the human mind to embrace the nature of God. I might be, dis I might be delusional. A lot of people have had visions in their delusions and I may be one of them. You have to be the judge of that. I don't think so. But I think we have to look at that in the name of truth in packaging. I believe I have experienced God as the source of life. Life was born on this planet about 3.7 billion years ago. Life was born as a single cell and as such began its journey in time until it arrived at its present stage which includes self-conscious complexity of creatures like you and me. So far as we know, a creature who can define life, contemplate its beginning, anticipate its termination, and raise the question of its meaning is a rare thing. Now if God is a source of life, then the only way I can appropriately worship God is by living fully. In the process of embracing the fullness of life, I bear witness to the reality of the God who is the source of life. Why is that so difficult? I believe I've experienced God as the source of love. Love is the power that embraces life. Love throws, flows through the whole universe in the care of nature in all its living forms, gives to its young. The love of God is present in the mama cat taking care of its kittens or the cow licking the newborn calf. But they don't know it. They have to have consciousness to know it. A human consciousness. But if God is the source of love, then the only way I can worship God is by loving. Loving wastefully. A phrase that I like, but so many Puritans don't. By wasteful love, I mean the kind of love that never stops to calculate. Never stops to wonder whether the object of its love is worthy to be its recipient. Wasteful love is love that never stops to calculate deserving. It is love that loves not because love has been earned. It is an act of loving wastefully. That's where I think God is made visible. Finally, I believe I experienced God in the words of my great theologian mentor, my, my greatest theological mentor, Reformed German theologian Paul Tillich who lived from 1886 to 1965. And he defined God as the ground of all being. That was a difficult series of words. It was borrowed and refined by Tillich from a philosopher named Plutinus in the third century of the common era who was not a Christian. He was a Greek philosopher. But if God is the ground of being then the only way I can worship God is by having the courage to be all that I can be. And the more deeply I can be all that I can be, the more I can do and make God visible. So the reality of God to me is discovered in the experience which compels me to live fully, to love wastefully, and to be all that I can be. The mission to which this understanding of God drives me is not to build a religious institution or to help people become religious people. I've said here this week that I'm more repelled by those who are attracted to what people call religion than I am drawn to them. 
They're so, so little-minded. Religious people just don't embrace the big questions of life. So the mission to which my mantra calls me is the task of building or transforming the world so that every person living will have a better opportunity to live fully, to love wastefully, and to be all that each of them was created to be. Then the church has a purpose, a universal purpose. In the widest variety of our humanity, in our deepest set of beliefs, there is no outcast in this community. There can be no one who is regarded as unclean. There can be no prejudice that are allowed to operate inside this vision of Christianity. The essence of Christianity, as I now understand it, is that everyone is to be accepted, quote, just as I am without one plea. Or maybe just as you are without one plea. And that everyone is called in the task of growing into all that each of us can be. To this mantra, I add one thing. I'm a Christian. I can't remember the day when I wasn't a Christian. I don't think that makes me superior to anybody. That's just a fact of my upbringing. I'm a disciple of Jesus. But why is that important to me? Because when I look at the life of Jesus, as that life has been refracted to me through Scripture and the tradition, I see a person who is so fully alive that I perceive him as the infinite source of life. I see one who loves so totally, so wastefully, that I perceive him as the infinite source of love. I see one who is profoundly capable of being all that he could be. Whether it was on Palm Sunday, as I mentioned yesterday, when he was hailed as a king, there's nothing quite so seductive as the sweet narcotic of human praise. Or whether it was on Good Friday when he was being put to death, when even the threat of non-being did not alter his humanity. In both experiences, Jesus was and is what he said he was. He was not changed by flattery, nor was his being diminished by the imminence of death. So I joined with St. Paul in the affirmation of faith. God was somehow in this Christ bringing oneness out of diversity, wholeness out of brokenness, eternity out of time. This is the God to whom I am drawn in worship. This is the Christ that points me toward the fullness of God. This is the faith I seek to share with the world, to embrace life, to increase love, and to have the courage to be. These for me are the doorways through which I walk into the mystery of God. Jesus is still my doorway. He doesn't have to be yours. He's my doorway into this reality. In this Jesus, the future of Christianity becomes visible once again, and I walk eagerly into this life experience. I welcome the Christianity to which this vision calls me. I bear witness to a faith that leads me and the whole world to learn the three principles of religion to live fully, to love wastefully, and to be all that you can be. Good luck. Amen. Bishop Spong's new book is called Unbelievable, Why Neither Ancient Creeds Nor the Reformation Can Produce a Living Faith Today. Uh, we will uh, begin our question and answer period. We already have a line over here. Let me just remind you, this is a time to answer questions, not to make speeches. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. 
Let right. me say I'm going to take the questions male, female, male, female. So right. you will reorganize your line to be that. I know. If we're not going to use this one. Go ahead, sir. I know. I appreciate your many lectures over the years. And you always said when someone asked you uh, for a reconstruction, you'd say, well, I'll get to that on Friday. <laughs> I think this is your Friday. Yeah. You have gotten a reconstruction today. My question is from John Coltrane, the great musician, jazz artist, who became a Muslim, if this might not be a good uh, mantra. I love supreme. I love supreme. I hoped it would be right there, but it's not right there. His song, I love supreme. And he says it over and over. And then he says it with the music. I love Supreme. I love Supreme. Da 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 da. I think it might be a mantra for you and the rest of us to meditate with all our lives. It's from John Coltrane. I love Supreme. Well, I'm always it glad to. It works for me instead of Almighty God, which never will work because God is not Almighty after Parkland schools or 9 11 or any other reason. And it isn't even a good translation of El Shaddai. I love Supreme. That's meditation. Yes. What I love is Chautauqua's willingness to take a chance on a stroke victim. I think that's a pretty uh. powerful dream, and I thank you for that. Uh. Uh. A lady. Are you a lady? Yes. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with you this morning, but I'm going to repeat this part. I am so grateful that they invited you here because you were the avenue by which 10 of us from Lawton, Oklahoma came and discovered Chautauqua. And oh my goodness, what a gift this has been. We are going back to a United Methodist Church. Uh, most of you know the, the challenge that is happening. Wondering how to stay faithful, but also honest, how to be present, uh, but not silent. We are the pastor, and I, and I do have a question, um, is, is afraid and, and of, of talking, let, having conversations among the congregation about the issues before us. Um, and, and that's a huge, huge challenge. But this is the question that, that rose for me. And you can address both of them, but this is the one that arose as I was sitting back there. You have repeated several times uh, the hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea. The next line is, that that blood was shed for me. I don't yeah. believe that part in Yeah, I don't either. So what's our second line? You have to be very selective. You have to be very selective when you're quoting evangelical hymns. Uh, okay. So just quit there? <laughs> let me say that uh, I visited this lady's church in Norton, Oklahoma. We had the services in the Museum of Natural History at the University of Oklahoma. There was a giant dinosaur right behind me while I was speaking. Mm. It's really, mm. really a fascinating time. Uh, and Oklahoma is one of the difficult states for regular Christians. They don't have many people out there that are not pretty fundamentalist. When I was writing my column, I had a black editor who was a graduate of Oklahoma Bible College. And he said to me, you don't know what prejudice is so you're a black homosexual from Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, that church in Norman was a church that was trying hard to get born. It's a, United, uh, it's, it's a congregational church, United Church of Christ, and practiced this kind of religion, a kind that was open, and it was at the university. The one man I know in Oklahoma is Robin Myers in Oklahoma City, who's a pastor, and he is a national treasure. He's, he's an outstanding person. And he came to that, that uh, series of lectures I did there. And it was a really marvelous time. I like to be in a situation where people are having to define their faith against the background of fundamentalism. Because it's pretty cruel. And uh, I think you did it well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Spong, I'm honored to be able to ask you a question. 
I'd like to know your response to uh, a biblical translation uh, and theology that came from my late father-in-law, Edward Heneman, who was a theologian for the Northern Presbyterian Church most of his career. In the Great Commission, he made the claim that the Greek of, the, of that verse is so ambiguous in different places that it could be translated differently than King James basically authorized uh, in that day of the, of the British, uh, you know, conquering. He said it could be translated, go out and live among the peoples of the world and love them. And if they want to be baptized, then baptize them. It's a very ironic, passive way of witnessing to, yeah. to the, the love of God in, in Jesus. What, what, what's your opinion about that? Well, I, th I think he's near to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and, and when I was working on that passage, I don't remember who it was that, that took me into it. But uh, I see people it's so tribal. You know, if you don't, aren't my tribe, you don't speak my language, you don't worship the way I worship, and there's something wrong with you, and I'm going to kill you. That's, that's our mentality. And this, this go into all the world, that meant you go beyond those prejudices and those biases and make a difference. And uh, I think your father-in-law was uh, on the path to the kingdom. I thank him for that. Uh, a, a lady. Thank you, Bishop Spong, for all that you've done. I will be forever grateful for your writings. Maybe what? a week. Maybe a week. <laughs> Forever's an awful long time. <laughs> all right. Well, I will be grateful for your writings, your lectures here, and the few words we've exchanged when you've signed my books. I, you have done so much to uh, show us how important moving forward to a more universalist way of opening the door to God is. And my question is, I love the church, and I understand that you do too. When I bring people to my church, I find my church home at the United Church of Christ, they are put off by the words. Yeah. Uh, those of us who already love the church can sort of uh, skip over those. Even here at Chautauqua, our newly printed worship bulletin or uh, book contains a lot of um, words that I think ought to be updated. How do you point us um, sort of as foot soldiers um, on our way? I can't do that. Uh, I just sort of skip over them too. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't cross my fingers, but I don't take them literally. And I don't know how, you have to constantly be doing that. Uh, but I come out of a tradition where the words were important to me when I was 12 years old, and they were, were important to me when I was a high school senior. And I can remember those, those times that those words carried me. If they don't carry me today, they carried me at a per certain period of their history. And I keep knowing that those words aren't eternal. I had to learn to do new words. The hymns are particularly awful. Uh, the hymns here use old tunes, which is what most people like. They like to sing the old tunes. They don't give a damn what the, what the words are, uh, nor they pay any attention to them. But uh, they like the old tunes. And uh, I can't stand Amazing Grace because it says that you're a wretch like me. I don't think I'm a wretch. I don't think you're a wretch, and, and I just don't think that hymn's very, very attractive. George Beverly Shea used to get out and start the Billy Graham, uh, whatever they were, uh, to warm up the crowd, and his favorite hymn was, How Great Thou Art. But you don't realize how great God is in that hymn until it reaches down, and God stoops down and lifts up a worm like you. It's a pretty, pretty desperate hymn. But I, I'm not going to give it up, but I'm, I'm going to vote against it every time. We, we used to do that in the Diocese of Newark. We'd periodically pass a resolution calling on the church to drop a hymn out of the hymn book. They never did, but it was really fun to say so. <laughs> uh, and we had a, a hymn that was an absolute sadomasochistic beauty. It was, Before thy throne, O God, we kneel. 
Give us a conscience quick to feel, a ready mind to understand the meaning of your chastening hand. Wean us and train us with your rod. Teach us to Ooh. know our faults, O oh God. <laughs> we ought to stop singing that hymn. That's a terrible <laughs> hymn. And, uh, and so I, I make this conscious. You know, I, I constantly make th things like this, make people think by bringing up an illustration like that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I personally want to thank you again for the deep and broad scholarly knowledge that you provide. I'm grateful. Thank you. My question is, will the universal faith that you and we hope for face not only a challenge from the institutional and theist church, but also from the financial, economic world that so dominates us? Yes, I think it will. It's hard to make change. It's hard to change institutions. Because everything affirms something in the society. So you just do that. Uh, but I think it'll pass. It's not going to happen immediately. What's going on is, is, is going on in the consciousness of people. We have churches where two or three people just can't stand the liturgy. And they make a real difference in time. You know, some, sometimes they, they give up and leave the church. Sometimes they get a, get a group together that wants to read a book. And they go to the church and they say, can we have a, a book study? And that's fairly innocuous. Most of the time they can get through that. But after a while, when they discover the books you're reading, the church slams the door. I had a good friend in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, this group of people wanted to have a book study group. And they picked some, some authors. I was one of them. And I felt good about that. But so was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and several other people. But the local rector of that church heard about it, and he went to him and he said, if you don't let me pick the book for you to study, you've got to get out of this church. So they did. They went to St. Matthew's, <laughs> where an alumnus of my diocese was the rector. And I was really happy about that. But uh, th that, that kind of irritation does cause growth. I went to a, we had a Methodist church somewhere either in Texas or, I think it was in Texas, where they went and the minister said, no, we're not going to have any, any discussion on anything that causes anybody to be upset. I thought, oh, that's really wonderful. Uh, I just suggest what you've got to do there is leave. And you've got to find another place where you can worship. But uh, the church is, that, that emphasis is present uh, right now. And... and some of, the, some of the clergy that are being open, they get reactions when they do something that's, that's a little bit different. And if, they, if you don't support them by standing firm, then they cave. So I would suggest you, you stand firm and be as uncomfortable as you can. Uh, that's good for clergy. Have uncomfortable lay people. Uh, and I think the lay people are far ahead of the clergy today. Uh, they live in a broader world. And that's not true of all clergy, but it's true of most clergy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop Spong, for sharing your gifts with us this week. My name is Devin Horn, and I'm from Albany, New York. And I'm a member of a, a community that's associated with the Association of Roman Catholic Women Priests. Yeah. And we are blessed in our community to have, have ordained six women priests. So within our liturgies, we have six women that are serving us and two men um, as priests every week. So my question comes from my own beliefs about the human need for rituals and words that resonate with our innermost yearnings and beliefs. And I think you've or alluding to this a little bit, but I just want to pin you down a little bit. <laughs> I wonder if you believe it is important for us to create or to recreate and reimagine the words and rituals that speak to our 21st century knowledge, or do we think, do you think we're just wasting our time given our demise as a Christian community? <laughs> no, I don't think you're doing that. Uh, we've got a group of 
I don't know how to describe them. They were, were they are very loyal Roman Catholics, but they're outside the church, and they meet regularly in their homes, and they celebrate the Eucharist. And women celebrate the Eucharist, and that upsets a lot of people because they don't have apostolic succession. I think apostolic succession and a dollar and a half will buy you a good cup of coffee uh, at Walmart. But uh, but what apostolic succession was for the benefit of order. They had to have order, and you had to have some cred credibility of saying this man is qualified to be a priest, and this one. But we've lost that, and I think it's an impediment. Uh, we had a a visitor from the Congregational Church in my church the other day. His name is Fred Plumer. He uh, is head of something called Progressive Christianity, and uh, he was he was the preacher of that day, and he was, you know, he's also in the sanctuary because you can't get rid of him if he's just in. In the pulpit, you know, you suddenly you got to take care of it. And so my rector did and, and had him administering communion. Well, I was glad the bishop wasn't there because uh, that would have probably created a problem. But Fred, without vestments, he didn't wear vestments. He had a T-shirt on. Uh, it's a, everybody else was in very elaborate vestments. And he was having more fun giving communion out. He didn't know how to do it. Took a whole handful, did it poker chip style. <laughs> But, uh, but and it had this beam on his face. And it, to me, it was just a wonderful moment when uh, uh, our rector t turned a moment that, that could have been difficult into something special. Uh, she's a special creature. And uh, I'm, I really enjoy her, and I'm delighted to be a member of her congregation. Thank you very much. I think we need rituals. Yes, sir. Hello? It's a pleasure, sir. Um, this is our second conversation over the years. Um, uh, my name is Anthony Agnello. I'm a former football coach. Uh, Get a little closer. I'm not hearing you. I'm a former football coach, former track coach uh, at Orchard Park High School, just up the, up the highway a little bit. And I'm currently the co-founder of the Peace Corps Alliance for Intercultural Understanding. What I heard you say during the course of this and previous discussions is something that sounded very universally true to me. And, and you might have seen this passage before. Abul Qasem Ferdosi, um, the author of the Persian classic Shah Nama, wrote that our purpose is to live, to love, to learn, and to leave a lasting legacy. Your legacy with your works is well intact. Um, what do we do going forward to promote this legacy, specifically in light of the Peace Corps Alliance for Intercultural Understanding? How do I get my former Peace Corps uh, associates and colleagues to pick up that baton and run forward? Well, that's a good question. If, if you want to know how you keep my legacy going, you probably can't. I might last my books might last two or three years after I die. That's be about all. I used to think they were long, give you a, a whole, well, I remember my first book, it's 120 pages, it's so little. One reviewer referred to it as a tract or a book review, or a pamphlet or something like that. But I thought, uh, I thought it was as big as a British encyclopedia because uh, I'd worked so hard on it. And when it came out, if they didn't have white pages in it, they wouldn't have gotten 100 pages. It had a lot of white pages in it that were divided between chapters. Uh, I, think, I think my heritage will be maybe five years at most. And I've sold a lot of books. They'll be in some libraries. Somebody will pick, pick them up and say, well, I wonder what that weirdo was. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a long jeopardy. And I don't worry about that. Uh, the world moves in cycles. And you add to your cycle. And then you pass out of existence and you, and then another cycle of places and then somebody picks up and you come back and, and uh, we have all sorts of cycles in our life. Uh, I told somebody the other day that I was born when Herbert Hoover was president and I uh, 
going to die when Donald Trump's president, and that's not progress. Uh, uh, that's just, that's just, but in the cycles of politics and the rest of life, we, we always are doubling back. And uh, I, I think Mr. Trump represents a, a racist revulsion to eight brilliant years of Barack Obama. Uh, I think he really did. But we got to live through the reaction. And I think we can live through the reaction, and we will live through that. I just hope it doesn't take long. Uh, uh, you know, as, as John Irvin said, I got to the place where I missed George W. Bush. Uh, he, he hadn't been around for a while, and I thought he's probably the worst president we ever had, but now he's not. <laughs> That's progress. So, but you, the cycles of life are always going, and you just participate in them in your, in your time, and don't worry about the future. I don't. Thank you, sir. Be a good coach. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've got a question. There's many of us that are no longer millennials or young people, but we have, Get a closer. We have living wills. We have uh, durable powers of health care. But at the end of life, we have funerals. And in the back of our book, there's always a order of funeral. Do you have an order of funeral for you? Yeah, I've already written it. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, I'm... I had some wonderful times writing my funeral. It took, a, I, although I heard from the diocese where you were, that something that I hadn't thought about before. The bishop died and recorded his own sermon that was prayed at his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real. That's a real first for me. I don't believe I'll do that. But uh, yeah, I, I had to borrow from hymns from other other books besides the Episcopal hymn book. Some, some hymns that I really enjoy. And I've had an opportunity in my life to, to be singing out of other hymn books. Cause we, I, do, I don't do very many Episcopal things, it's per se. But, uh, yeah, it was fun. And I picked the people I wanted to speak. And mostly it's my lawyer and my rector. I can't tell you how much I love my lawyer because I conferred with him five days a week for 24 years over something going on in our diocese. And he was a wonderful asset to me. And if anybody knows me, it's my rector and my lawyer. And uh, I hope they'll have a good time. Uh, I had a cousin who left in his will enough money to pitch a party after the funeral in Charlottesville. So we had a great time having a party on my on my cousin uh, in the and I'd like to I'd like to do that too I you know I'm not I don't want to say to anybody that I'm looking forward to dying uh, I'm not but I can manage it uh, I don't I don't think I'd enjoy not seeing Chris anymore but other than that I don't know anything that's particularly horrible about that and uh well, y'all come. <laughs> That's all I can say. It'll be a learning experience for you. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for the invite. I, I appreciate that, and I've appreciated every minute that uh, I've been able to spend here with you. Just a few, and it's made a big impact in my life. Um, yesterday, you spoke uh, quite a bit about... Uh, examples in nature that you've used to recast and in some ways deconstruct. Get a little closer, I'm having a hard time hearing. As, is that okay? Uh, yesterday you were speaking a great deal about nature and uh, the divine within nature and the intelligence within nature and you used um, that framework in some ways to reorient or and deconstruct or challenge um, the sin and salvation paradigm in Christianity. And I wondered if, kind of like Joseph Campbell did many years ago, if you see nature, yeah. the divine in nature, the Gaia principle, the mother principle as a framework that Christians can adopt in an effective way in the new church. Well. 
to me, you can't be a member of everything. You've got to be a member of something. And what you've got to do is to go beyond that something. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't ever mind suggesting that I'm a Christian. But I don't want people to draw implications for that, that, that I look down on somebody who isn't. And that's part of the Christian tradition. And I don't think I can name my successor. I think those are pitiful. Uh, people who sort of want to groom somebody to succeed them in, in their particular role in the church. The church will produce a, another Jack Swan very soon. Probably won't be in the Diocese of Newark because it doesn't work that way. But uh, the last one was in California. His name was Jim Pike. And I get compared to him from time to time. I liked him, but he was really weird. Uh, toward the end of his life, he became an alcoholic. He started talking to his toothbrush because it was his son had committed suicide. And he had a, he had a really tough time. Now, in England, I liked it better when I get compared to John Robinson. Now, he's not somebody everybody here knows, but uh, he was a great human being that the church didn't care for. He was a bishop of Suffolk, and uh, Woolwich in Suffolk. And the church, when he wrote his book, Honest to God, in 1963, the church recoiled, but the people of England ate it up. And suddenly this book was a topic of conversation at every pub in England. And the taxi drivers in London, I'd get in, they'd say, do you know that Bishop Robinson? And it was just amazing to me. But the Archbishop of Canterbury said, some pompous thing. And uh, he said, well, I remember him saying that he was, he was offending little people's faith. And he said, Archbishop, you need to realize that little people are growing up. And I thought that was a pretty good answer to, to that sort of thing. But that's just the way, that's just the way it is. And uh, I, don't, I don't worry about legacies. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned your first book and the work that went into it. I was wondering if you could remind us what your first book was and if there's anything you would revise now at this point. I'm having a hard time hearing it. Uh -huh. Remind you of me of what? The name of your first book. Oh, yeah, it was Honest Prayer. I can remember that far back. That was in 1972, I believe, or 71. And it was called Honest Prayer. I think it may still be in print, but not from Harper. It's a little publisher in New Jersey brings out my books when Harper drops them. It's, uh, it was a play on John Robinson. John Robinson wrote a book called Honest to God, and he had a, a, a chapter ended on prayer, and I named this Honest Prayer right, to play on John Robinson whom I really had a, just a great, great affection for. And uh, it did very well. Uh, I say that. It was the first book of an unknown author. But it sold about 12,000 copies, and that's a success. Uh, a, a book makes profit at about 3,500 copies. That is, the publisher gets all their, their costs out of a book at about 3,500 copies. And after that, it's gravy for the publisher. And uh, the book is still, it's, it's sold over a thousand copies in this new version. The new publisher in Haworth, New Jersey, I think it's called St. Johann's Press. But uh, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> that, that too, many, the, too many years have passed. part of the question was anything you would revise from your early works? No, I don't think that works. I, I wrote another book. <laughs> uh, I've written on prayer several more times in the course of my life and always from a different perspective but uh, if, you, if you want to see closer to where I would be today on prayer this last book has three chapters on prayer and a book called A New Christianity for a New World has two chapters on prayer that are better than honest prayer last question you've referred today a couple of times to not liking words and hymns I'm a lifelong Episcopalian married to a clergy person, clergyman, who struggles with that at his liberal church in Buffalo. And I'd love to hear, if you would care to reveal them, the names of the hymns you've chosen for your funeral and any sources you might want to recommend for someone who struggles with 
finding hymns that really speak to 21st century culture. Yeah. Well, I try to remember them. They're not fresh in my mind. Uh, the, f- the first one is a non-Episcopal hymn. What's it called, Chris? I don't know, dear. You don't know. <laughs> she knows everything. I don't understand why she didn't know that. <laughs> she says she hadn't attended my funeral yet. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's written by a Methodist in the 1990s. And... Uh, and it's about, about movement into the future and it has verses that go into all the controversies of the church. There's a great one in the book by... Uh, God, I can't remember anything right now. What's, uh, it's, it's hymn 590. What is it? Uh, it's uh, first the, the Riverside Church Rector. A great guy from the early 20s. No. God of grace and God of glory. That's right. God of grace and God of glory. To that great, great tune. But, uh, and let me tell you just about one hymn writer. We sang a hymn of his, I believe, yesterday here. His name is Fred Kahn. He's a Dutchman who was a member of the Congregational Church of England. And he moved to England. And he used to write his sermons and then go through the hymn book looking for hymns that would support his sermon and never could find one. So he wrote one every week. He wrote a hymn every week to go with his sermon. He didn't, he didn't know a word of music. And so he turned it over to a guy who was a musician and he attached them to a tune. And now you get the books of Fred Kahn's hymns. And uh, you might look them up. They're, they're pretty popular here. Not one of them is in the Episcopal hymn. Uh, but... Uh, I, I just am very fond of Fred and his, his wife too, and uh, but we don't have hymns like that anymore. My mentor here said we would have no more questions. I don't know what we're going to do. Okay. I just wondered if we. My name is Lisa McAllister, and I'm a lifelong minister's daughter, <laughs> Presbyterian minister's daughter. And while we've been here this week, this is a certain age demographic. I've heard a lot about end of life discussions. I wonder if you might just take us back in the other direction. Uh, As a minister's daughter, I no longer go to church. I didn't raise my children going to church because I didn't think that what they were getting was the truth. And I have been out there like a boat without a rudder. And I wanna say thank you for throwing a life preserver because you have given me a door back into re-examining Christianity Uh, from a position of truth, but I'd like to know your thoughts on how you're the daughter that said, Dad, none of that is pertinent anymore, your Stanford PhD, and your grandchildren, how are they moving forward, and how do I take my children forward? Well, I wish I could tell you. Uh, I've got six grandchildren, and three of them have never been baptized. Three of them have been. Uh, one of the three who's never been baptized is going to church in Atlanta. Uh, my oldest granddaughter is a doctor in Richmond, and she's pretty active in the church. At least she was when I was remember her and spent time with her. She's got a brother who goes to church once in a while, but he's, uh, he's really more interested in making money. It's, he's, he's a money-making man. There's no doubt about that. And he's going to be a rich man someday. And I hope, I hope he's 27. I hope he'll find something that will enrich his life. Uh, I've got another grandson who uh, I thought might be a priest. He's a law student at Harvard at this moment. And uh, I said to him, Johnny, I'd like for you to think about being a priest. He said, I'd be a funny priest if I don't believe in God. <laughs> but he's the most compassionate person I've ever met. Uh, his compassion for the underdog, the underprivileged. Uh, and he's, he's Harvard University, Harvard Law School's primary student on the Democratic Party platform in Massachusetts. Now that, that may cause cheers from some place and booze from others, but He's, all his life, he's been way out there on 
issues of compassion and equality. And uh, I, I think he's a wonderful human being. And then we've got two little twins in Vermont. And uh, their parents don't go to church. But whenever we go to Vermont to see them, we go by. And we go to church. And they decided they don't have to go with us. Just a month ago, they were both with us. And the mother came. Uh, she was raised a Roman Catholic and had a pretty terrible experience, was abused. And, and uh, she had everything that you'd think of that's bad. But she's now coming back. And uh, she was making inquiries about singing in the choir. Now, there's only one church in Peacham. That's a town of about 51 people uh, in Vermont. And it's, uh, you know, they've got a rector who's 85 years old. That's rather interesting. But he's a wonderful guy. He's a real life-affirming guy, happy guy. And he's been an active uh, United Church of Christ pastor all his life. Served some great big churches. And now he's having a wonderful time serving this church in Peacham. Uh, it's got maybe a hundred members, I'd guess. Uh, but it's the kind of church that is a community affair. You go into that church and he has an opening prayer. And then he gives you the news. The news is who's out of town, who's in the hospital, what's been operated on, which, which organ is it that's hurting. And... Uh, and it just tells you the whole town news. You, I don't see how you can live in that community and not know the town news if you go to that church. And then he gets into the sermon. And at 85 years old, he does a really good job. Uh, anyway, I've loved my experiences in the church. There have been some bad times. I know I'm being goosed down. Uh, <laughs> but uh, having a parish church where I belong has been a very important lesson for me. And uh, having, I have had a time when I didn't care for the rector of any one of my churches. And uh, that's kind of tough. But I'm, I, I get back after a while because rectors don't last forever. Thank you all. Wait, Bye-bye. wait, wait. Before we, before we thank Bishop Spong, uh, you cannot have been here for four days and not believe that his love for Christine and her devotion to him is something to be admired. And would you join me in welcoming and saying goodbye to Christine? Thank you, Bishop Spong. You have enriched our lives so much.